Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here in such a distinguished and important place before this uh, important gathering. I started my uh, student career in Delhi University in St. Stephen's College to become a physicist because I was uh, very interested in Indian philosophy and wanted to bridge the gap of philosophy and theoretical physics. And I went overseas for my PhD in physics, but I switched to uh, computer science and started a career in uh, the computer industry and then telecom and then had my own companies. And um, in, in the mid-90s, I decided to leave that and start my other journey, which is what I'm now doing, which is to understand our civilization better, our history better, what makes India different, what is better about it, worse about it, how to uh, use our traditional knowledge along with modern knowledge to move forward, both for India and for the rest of the world. So I've lived in the US a total of 40 years and um, never missed a year when I didn't come to India. Typically I'm coming three, four times a year. So I'm very well connected with the Indian soil and Indian way of thinking. One of the projects we did, which might interest you because of your scientific background, is, you know, there is a famous 30-volume series that was done by Joseph Needham in Cambridge on the history of Chinese science. And this made a big difference on the Chinese uh, position in the world because every library, every center in the world that studies China has this collection. And so China is not considered some primitive, mystical, uh, backward society traditionally, but a very developed, advanced society throughout its history because of its contribution. Nobody had done something like that for India. So my foundation decided that we'll do 20 volumes on history of Indian science and technology. We've been in this project single-handedly for 12 years. And we decided that each volume will cover one topic and it, it'll be done by one or more Indians based in India with international peer reviews and so on. We've published nine volumes al already. These are available. And they cover things like uh, history of Indian metallurgy, uh, water, har water harvesting, uh, the, uh, 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 the Harappan and Indus Valley civilization, ancient science, ancient technology. And we will be doing things like textiles and medicine and uh, agriculture, mathematics, astronomy, all these things. And to prevent uh, quackery or chauvinism, which, is, which can spoil the reputation of uh, scientific work, we only include what is verifiable with empirical evidence. So for instance, if someone says there were nuclear bombs in Mahabharat, we want them to show us a crater with radioactivity. And until they can show us a crater with radioactivity, it does not satisfy the empirical evidence. I'm sure all of you being nuclear scientists, you know that this is, it would not be possible to have had nuclear bombs with no trace of radioactivity. So that is a test. Now, if you meet that test, you can, within that test, you can find fantastic things about steel, which did not rust, and which has a, a few microns uh, coating of phosphorus or something interesting. So the issue is, how did they do this? What seems like nanotechnology in those days, how did they do this? You find amazing things in um, Harappan uh, tiles, uh, the way these tiles are manufactured, and a decentralized Indus Saraswati civilization with Dhola Veera and Harappa Mahinjadar or 2000 sites. Many paradoxes about how things were done which makes it more interesting. And then weights, the standard weights which are binary, the ratio is 1, 2, 4, 8 like that weights. And the way the, the streets and lanes and the water is managed and all that is exceedingly sophisticated how the economic history of India until 1750 was very advanced, more than 24% of the GDP of India, of the world was in uh, India, and about a similar number in uh, China. And over a 100 year period from 750 onwards, 1750 onwards, India's GDP declined, manufacturing output declined, and that's when the West became uh, very industrialized. So we're interested in studying uh, these kind of things to counteract the view that uh, India's 
spiritual uh, you know uh, background and advancement and uh, mysticism made indians otherworldly and not capable of solving practical problems and materialistic problems because indians actually have been doing both there is great philosophy uh, there is great mathematics and linguistics and all kinds of fantastic theoretical studies but also enormous amounts of developments at the same time which are of a very practical nature which affects society so the, the this is a this is an interesting uh, problem area uh, to understand and one of the paradoxes is that there are several texts which give amazingly accurate predictions like the value of pi the value of the velocity of light there are sutras which give pretty good uh, values but there's no proof of how you got it there is no evidence of measurement of that kind so how was it how was it developed and was there a new methodology was there a state of con consciousness that uh, somehow the ancients were able to achieve and in that state of consciousness have an intuition have a unity with some object that they're looking at because rishis talk about the ability of human beings to achieve a state of consciousness where the subject object the object of inquiry uh, is unified with the subject there is no subject object separation and it is a quality where there is a total knowledge of what you are what you are uh, observing so the observer observed unity uh, brings about a different kind of insight and it is not something we can fully understand today because uh, i don't know if there are there are people today who can demonstrate that but the uh, the the evidence is that whatever predictions they made seem to be in many cases quite amazingly accurate uh, so the question that this leads to is whether there is such a thing as inner sciences uh, empirical inner sciences outer science has to satisfy the empirical criteria that it should be verifiable it should be reproducible so if you do an experiment somebody else should be able to do it and if they satisfy all the requirements it should produce the same results well the yogis claim that there is an inner science which is also verifiable that if you follow a certain process for long enough and in a clean environment just like you have to have a very clean room to conduct a, a high energy particle physics or any kind of a very sophisticated uh, chemistry experiment so similarly the equivalent of an inner clean room has to be created the inner silence inner stillness has to be created and if certain processes are carried out you will observe certain things and this is verifiable by others so this is this claim and i'm not saying it is true or false but this claim is the basis of uh, what's called adhyatma vidya or inner sciences and this adhyatmic knowledge uh, is the basis uh, of a huge amount of tradition that has evolved uh, in, 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 in our country. Now, this is the basis of uh, higher truth in Indian uh, tradition, contrasted with the, uh, with the traditions of the West which rely on history of a prophetic lineage. Some prophets come historically unique, historically exclusive, prophetic lineage. So the only way you can know the truth is to believe in their history because you cannot ever have that experience yourself. The difference in the case of Indian claim is that you can have that same experience yourself even if it is very rare, even if it is very difficult. But there's always in every period, in every century or so, there are always one or two great exemplars who repeat, replicate that experience. And so that same knowledge gets refreshed and retransmitted for the new generation. So we are less reliant on history uh, uh, of uh, uh, the discovery because we can empirically reproduce it ourselves. So this is a very interesting uh, distinction between Indian traditions and Western traditions where the, in the Western traditions it is theoretically non-reproducible and there are good logical arguments why it is simply impossible to reproduce what was one of a kind event whereas in the Indian tradition it is always possible to reproduce any accomplishment or any claim uh, of a higher exalted experience that somebody had. So this uh, methodology 
uh, being a scientific claim, cl a scientific claim, uh, has uh, nurtured a tradition of inquiry, free thinking, debate, argumentation, proving somebody wrong and replacing you with something better of your own, without any fight. Like in Europe, there was a big, there's been a big fight between science and religion. So, uh, when something scientists come up with something new then the religion is threatened because they are closed and this new thing is outside their jurisdiction and it is not possible so there's a fight and this fight has actually never been resolved and in this book I explain that the West is a composite, a synthesis, an artificial synthesis of the Judeo-Christian Hebraic tradition on one side which is based on revelation and the Hellenistic Greek tradition of reasoning logic on the other side. And these have been artificially put together and they are not part of one philosophical worldview. Whereas in the Indian tradition we have not artificially reached a truce or a ceasefire between fighting uh, you know segments, fighting sides, but the uh, spirit of inquiry and the spirit of debate and uh, reprodu uh, replacing some truth with higher truth, more uh, better discovery in the inner realm and outer realm has always been there. So uh, what I was calling Adhyatma Vidya or inner science is the reason why this uh, conflict has never existed because it is also a scientific claim. Uh, the Rishi claims I have achieved, uh, I have done a certain practice and I have re received something, I have achieved something and another Rishi comes along and he has to reproduce it, replicate it uh, and sometimes people come and have a different theory. So this pursuit of higher knowledge as a kind of empirical uh, pursuit has kept the, uh, the, 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 has prevented a problem from the uh, science versus religion type of conflict as has uh, inflicted the, the West in a, in a major way. Now what I uh, concluded after uh, living in the US for 40 years is that there is a, there is a thing I'm calling Western universalism. So the subtitle of this book is An Indian Challenge to Western Universalism. Western Universalism I, I refer to as the West's claim that its experiences are universal. Its history is universal. Every society will go through the same stages the West went through. So they went through this stage of uh, old tradition, modernity, postmodernity. so they want to know. So when they look at Indian history they try to come up with these uh, demarcations. And unfortunately, Indian historians have bought it. Indian historians are talking about medieval period, pre-medieval period, ancient period, uh, modern period. But our society did not require a conflict and a contradiction to bring about change and did not require a fight with the past because the past was never closed. The past is open and so can keep evolving. So we can be traditional and modern and postmodern at the same time. So this demarcation, uh, this uh, approach to Western thinking uh, need not be universal. And the West's philosophies which have emerged from this Western uh, historical experience uh, have been projected as universal. So the question is, uh, are there alternatives to uh, Western universalism? And in this book, I'm discussing some philosophical Indian challenges. And one of them is the, uh, I challenge the Western universalism claim of unique historical non-reproducible human experiences that are the only recourse to higher truth. And these, this belief of theirs is what leads to a very powerful institution, church or some kind of institution that you become dependent on them because they know the knowledge of that history and you don't. And so if it's sort of like saying that the only way you can understand Newtonian laws is that there is a society which was started at the time of Newton and they have a kind of exclusive franchise to teach you what the Newtonian laws are and you cannot reproduce them and measure them and test them and validate them for yourself because it is not uh, possible to empirically reproduce it. It's that sort of a claim. And this is, this is a, a very major flaw in uh, uh, Western spiritual traditions and philosophical traditions, the over-dependence on hi historical absolutes, which in our case we don't have. And in this book I 
differentiate between itihas and history in this particular sense because itihas is different than history because of its flexibility and it's recontextualized for every era. It's brought into the modern context, into the present context and it's flexible, you can change it. And the itihas need not be need not be the necessary and exclusive means of understanding the truth. So whether an event happened or not, the point is you can, the philosophy can be validated today. So that is very different. And this requires a society to develop yoga, to develop, you know, spiritual meditations and spiritual practices, which are all kinds all over the spectrum in India. And these techniques which are embodied which we do in the present moment with ourselves is the equivalent of a laboratory. So it's an inner laboratory, if you will, in which you can conduct these experiments uh, and people can compare notes. People used to do peer reviews. There were debates which are like peer reviews where uh, experts who had done these things for a very long time would uh, make claims and debate each other's claims and uh, it's sort of like peer reviews. So my uh, uh, concern which led to the writing of this book is that Western universalism became very powerful in the last few hundred years because of the Western colonial influence. So the West spread its universal ideas, values, morals, ethos uh, universally. And uh, traditional knowledge was downsized during the colonial era and uh, colonial knowledge was increased and this, uh, over a period of many generations, Indians started uh, adjusting to this, thinking that uh, what is being taught is, in fact, how, who they are. So a lot of information and knowledge about our own society we've gained through the gaze of Europeans. The European uh, perspective, uh, the European study of uh, India and its society uh, has uh, become exported back to Indians and we've downloaded this and installed these, uh, these ways of thinking. Uh, that is kind of what I refer to as a colonized mind. So we, are, we may be decolonized politically, but we are still mentally colonized. We are still looking at their way of uh, thinking. So this, uh, this challenge is what I have been working on and I intend to continue writing more books on the same subject of uh, uh, questioning whether, this, whether there are alternatives to this Western universalism. Now China has come up with a, what they call Confucian, Confucian modernity. Confucianism is their philosophy and based on Confucian thought uh, they have started uh, 100 institutes around the world called Confucian institutes they have in different countries to propagate Confucian thought. Because part of being a great civilization, they also want to have a counter to Western civilization's claim of universalism. And they want to, so there is something they are calling Confucian ethics, Confucian modernity, a Confucian way of thinking, a Confucian way of uh, truth. So uh, that is an alternative to, that is already a challenge which uh, China is posing. And so I thought maybe uh, some Indians should uh, think about is there an Indian alternative to Western universalism also. That's what my, uh, what my project is, uh, is all about. Now, I found that a number of Indian ideas have been studied by Westerners. Uh, then after studying them, they removed the Indian sources, claimed them to be of Western origin, claimed them to be their own, kind of plagiarism or appropriation, and uh, put their own name on it. Uh, and this is a, a series of books I'm writing which I call the U-turn theory where knowledge starts here, it's taken somewhere, it's taken out of the Indian context, it's considered to be non-Indian but something else. A new pioneer, a new inventor puts their own name on it. Then they claim that it's part of Western history, it's derived from Western sources. And then this new westernized knowledge or new westernized claim of knowledge is re-exported to India. So a good example is uh, there is a prominent Harvard uh, thinker, uh, Harold Gardner, who is touring India routinely. He comes and gives talks in Mumbai, I think. 
uh, and uh, he was in uh, a few weeks ago in Bangalore speaking at Infosys and he he developed some few decades ago a pioneering theory called multiple intelligences which said that there's many kinds of intelligences there's emotional intelligence rational intelligence there's many kinds of intelligences and this became a revolution in uh, education so when you educate people you should educate them for different kinds of intelligence to make a full person when i started researching the early uh, early period of this idea coming together i realized the indian influences were there but they are not being acknowledged for instance i found that sri arbindo wrote about planes and parts of being that being has got many planes and many parts and this uh, idea of being having many planes and many parts uh, is essentially that there are many kinds of intelligences many levels of intelligences many parts of intelligences that need to be nurtured to have a whole being and also in the natashastra there is many rasas each rasa is a certain quality that you cultivate so what harold gardner is calling multiple intelligences is a kind of a diluted version simplified version of uh, you know with a lot of new jargon but of something which is very traditionally found in our country this is very interesting uh, another example i found is that vivek swami vivekanand influenced tells tesla nikola tesla who was the great guy in energy and electricity and all that physicist around the turn of the 19th century uh, there is a correspondence i discovered between swami vivekanand and Nik nikola tesla after uh, some talks that vivekanand gave in uh, his visits to boston area and harvard uh, tesla was in the audience and in one place uh, swami vivekanand says that energy and matter are really the same thing and they interchangeable and tesla does not have a, uh, does not agree with that that because at that time the physics of uh, matter is well defined and the physics of energy is separate and this idea that uh, energy matter uh, this is 20 years before e equals mc squared came along so there's a there's a there's a uh, there's a correspondence between them in which swami vivekanand as keeps insisting and tesla is very curious about this interesting possibility but not quite sure of it so there are influences of this sort which you will not find mentioned when they teach the history of ideas they don't talk about this when they talk about the history of ideas uh, there's many uh, 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 other instances you know like today one of the things that is at the cutting edge of neuroscience in the west is a lot of research is being done on yogis who are very advanced yogis who have who can achieve a lot of uh, uh, higher states of consciousness and special effect, things they can do and tibetan meditators so a lot of functional mri scans are being done to correlate what they are doing and what it does to the brain and new kinds of neuroscience theories are being formulated but the inventors are always the westerners who made the observation and not the indian who is able to produce the effect I mean, that's like somebody runs a 100 meter dash very fast and the gold medal goes to the guy with the stopwatch who measured it you know that sort of thing so the person who's measuring the yogi uh, puts it writes a paper puts it out and says that's my and he gives it a very special new effect he calls it names it somewhere and it's considered some new kind of a scientific discovery so i have uh, seen how herb benson in harvard studied transcendental meditation Yo mahesh yogis maharishi mahesh yogis transcendental meditation in the 60s and 70s and created and patented and trademarked uh, his own technique called relaxation response he just changed the name and uh, uh, he's a big shot at harvard started a multi million dollar r&d thing got a lot of uh, grants from the federal government to do bio biological and neurological research on it i've looked at uh, the research by Steven Leberge in Stanford a prominent neuroscientist cognitive scientist who has come up with a term lucid dreaming but when i talk to him privately he acknowledges that he learned it from a guru and the indian technique is called uh, yoga nidra so he learned yoga nidra gave it a different name and he has institutes in in uh, austria in vienna and 
five, six other places in the world, and he's become a big shot. And um, uh, by the way, the U.S. Army uh, uses Yoga Nidra training for combat soldiers in Iraq because they realize that uh, to de-traumatize them, they need some, uh, it's better than any drugs, it's better than any other uh, mental technique that they tried. They tried many techniques and they found this Yoga Nidra to be the most effective technique. So one uh, Mr. Miller, I think is his name, in the U.S. got the contract to go and conduct training. So these are some of the examples of appro appropriations and misappropriations of knowledge uh, that has originated, uh, which I would consider to be uh, Indian uh, approaches to science, uh, neurological science, especially uh, cognitive science, uh, yoga, uh, psychology. Certainly in the life sciences, uh, today a lot of these ideas are being uh, uh, taken to the West, re-classified uh, as Western origin. So the question is, is there something which Indian scientists can do differently? Can Indian scientists m map can Indian scientists recover, rediscover? Is there a renaissance possible where we can do science differently? Uh, where we can, uh, you know, right now the science as we have learnt is a sort of a Western model and it is applicable. You can reproduce the effects in the nuclear reactor and it works the same way. But are there theories of, like quantum physics for instance, when quantum physics came out, Einstein had a problem with it. Einstein had a serious problem uh, with the uncertainty, idea of uncertainty. And uh, both Heisenberg and Schrodinger were very much influenced by Vedantin thought by Upanishads. They quoted them. Schrodinger, in fact, had a copy of uh, Upanishads and uh, Gita, which he uh, uh, studied much of his life. And philosophically, they both said that this is the only system of philosophy that makes sense with quantum mechanics because all the Western philosophies were reductionist and not able to make sense of this. So since life sciences have started in the West started going towards the study, the neurological sciences going towards the study of higher states of consciousness, much of it from, inspired from Indian sources. And since the origins of quantum physics also had a lot to do with uh, in similar inspirations. Uh, the question is whether there is more than just this, whether the well is deeper and whether this well needs to be explored in a, in a deeper way. And that's, that's my quest and that's what I uh, wish to bring to your attention. So this book, uh, Being Different, discusses uh, why preserving difference is important because if you preserve difference, then you have alternate methods of discovery. I give you examples already of the benefits of having a separate Indian tradition alive because even the West is benefiting from using this methodology. Uh, and if you do not preserve the diversity uh, the, and everything gets digested and mapped and uh, re replaced as part of Western universalism, then there's only one methodology of thinking, when only one methodology of science and inquiry and philosophy and values and society. Uh, if you can keep this multi-faceted approach, uh, then you know perhaps there is more potential for new breakthroughs and, and uh, new discoveries. I also found uh, in this, uh, I mentioned in this book, uh, attitudes towards chaos or what the West considers chaos. Uh, West's idea of uncertainty, unpredictability is very uncomfortable. There's something wrong that has to be fixed because uh, truth should be certain. Yes, no. But in Indian logic, Greek, uh, in uh, Jain logic, a proposition could be true or false or neither true nor false or both true and false or neither not true nor, nor, nor not false and so on. So there's many values it can take in between the two extremes of true-false. And now people are looking at this multi-valued logic and fuzzy logic and chaos theory. 
the uh, whole uh, chapter uh, four of this book is on order and chaos philosophically looked at from an Indian point of view compared and contrasted with the uh, with the western point of view and the western point of view started with uh, Aristotle's law of the excluded middle which said a proposition can be true or false and that's it and that has been dominating western thought now westerners recently are also looking at this Indian idea and quite interested in this Indian idea and I'm wanting Indians also to start taking these uh, taking their own heritage more more seriously and then finally uh, there's a big difference I'm pointing out uh, in chapter 5 in the area of certain Sanskrit Sanskrit sounds Sanskrit uh, vibrations which are non-translatable because they, they, there are certain words whose effect is not just a conceptual meaning you know like if you say apple and you say it in another language it refers to some physical object that's it but there are certain words which are not referring to some physical object that you can point at but referring to some in some some experience and a civilization which never had that experience does not have a word for it so you cannot replace this word with something similar that they have which may seem similar but is not going to be the same thing it is going to be a distortion so the discovery of Sanskrit non translatables things which are not translatable which are unique so you can only like yoga is yoga you cannot say it's exercise you cannot say it's gymnastics you cannot say it's prayer uh, so there are certain words of that kind and uh, I've identified about 20 and given you reasons why the common translations are not valid and I think there's many more like that the Sanskrit philosophi like Bharatahari and Panini and before that makes clear that the uh, more significant than the intellectual meaning of a word is its vibrational effect so a word a certain sound has a certain vibrational effect it is it is a you know it's sort of like if you have a certain vibration in a system uh, it's not what it means but what is its physical effect there so this same way a words what it, how it sounds is unique and it cannot be replaced by another sound because another sound will be a different vibration a different signature and will have a different effect so the Sanskrit philosophy is very clear that man, man, basic mantras not all conventional words like you know apple kind of thing but really basic uh, foundational which are what are called beej mantras are non translatable because they have a vibrational effect so one of the areas of interest I have is to do some research empirical research on what do these vibrations mean or what do they produce what is the effect of these vibrations and people are doing this kind of research so I will stop here uh, and basically I've given you a quick overview of my general areas of interest a little bit about the what I think is very distinct about uh, Indian civilizations contributions including to science and the contribution in this book and I'll be delighted to take uh, questions. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I just started reading your book a few days ago and I must say I'm quite enjoying it. I have although read uh, just few pages. Um, one reason could be that uh, your thoughts resonate with my own and uh, many times I uh, feel that you are expressing the things in different words and sometimes words have been given to the thoughts uh, which, uh, for which I could never find words. So I'm really quite enjoying it. In fact, uh, in the beginning, uh, that the things you mentioned, like um, your uh, problem with uh, uh, the use of tolerance uh, between different religion, and you say it should be mutual respect. I I think that's an excellent way of putting the things, and I think that that's something which should be. Uh, known to people that it's not tolerance it is mutual respect which is uh, uh, quite important and then you go on to talk about uh, things like uh, uh, you don't like the use of what if I got it right uh, idol you know which westerners describe at and you say image of course here uh, I have not really fully understood like I didn't fully understand what you said in your lecture today the difference between itihas and history that's a different thing of course uh, it may take some time for me to understand um, there is uh, uh, another thing 
uh, uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, was it uh, uh, Shri Vivekanand who talked about uh, energy matter? Uh, yes. Yeah. But the point is that, you know, such things uh, you can talk in uh, uh, one context and uh, like uh, E equal to MC square is in a different context. Yes. Why I am saying this is for the following reason that, <clears throat> in fact, some years ago I was uh, giving a talk on, I am basically a theoretical physicist. Good. <laughs> I was giving a talk on uh, what you mentioned about Einstein's uh, difficulty with uh, uh, understanding the, uh, you know, basic uh, uh, philosophy of uh, quantum mechanics itself. So on the famous, of course, you would know it, uh, uh, einstein podolsky rosen paradox. Sure. Um, <clears throat> after the talk, one of the professors, he came up to me and he said, uh, uh, Professor Puri, do you know? Uh, Ghalib said something about uh, quantum mechanics. I said I never knew it. And then he, uh, you know, uh, uh, said the following, and those lines I still remember, I heard them several years ago. Asle shuhudo shahido mashhud ek hai. I will explain it. Asle shuhudo shahido mashhud ek hai. Herahu fir mushahida ekis hisab me. So Ghalib says that, really speaking, the observer, the act of observation and the object under observation, they are all same. So I do not know what constitutes observation. And you will agree that uh, this is what basic uh, philosophy of or basic uh, premise of quantum mechanics is. But of course, uh, obviously, Ghalib had nothing to do with the quantum mechanics. The context is different. It's a different thing altogether. So, <clears throat> so um, I mean, sometimes the same thought in different contexts, you know, it may look uh, similar, but uh, the meaning could be uh, different. And uh, I was just talking with somebody else who has read your book. Um, so he was uh, thinking that, uh, are you talking about uh, replacing one universalism with another? But my take on it was, as I understood from your first few pages, uh, keeping in mind what you say uh, uh, about mutual respect, is that I don't think you are saying that. Of course, you are in best position to tell in the sense that are you um, advocating that Western universalism be replaced very crudely speaking by, let's say, Indian universalism? Are you, re are you saying that? In I, I thought that you are not saying it. Okay, these are wonderful questions. Uh, uh, and and uh, 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 let me just write down uh, uh, the, the three points I got. The, the, uh, I'll start with uh, uh, each of them. I think uh, it's wonderful you read the book and you reminded me to talk about uh, tolerance and mutual respect. Uh, so for the benefit of those who haven't, I've had a lot of experience uh, in the West challenging some of their terms and once you, when you challenge a term, replace, replace it with another term, you realize how deeply they are invested in one term and how reluctant they are to replace it with another term. I was uh, at a conference, this has happened in many conferences, but at some interreligious conference uh, where they were passing a resolution and all the leaders of different religions were there and the resolution was drafted to say that we all tolerate each other. So I raised my hand and said tolerance is actually quite insulting because you wouldn't like your spouse to say that I tolerate you in the house or your colleague in the office to say, I tolerate you to sit next to me, or someone to invite you to dinner and say, you know, I tolerate you to eat next to me. It shows that you, it's an insult. There's something wrong with you and I'll put up with you. That is what tolerance means. And tolerance, religious tolerance has a peculiar history in Europe when uh, the different kingdoms had exclusive ideas, exclusive denominations of Christianity and the others were banned. So the, it was an illegal criminal offense to belong to some other church. And so then they uh, reach a truce, a treaty, which says I'll tolerate your religion and you tolerate my religion. So it is a very, it has its own peculiar history. So this is an example of taking Western universalism. Their idea of tolerance is a very big breakthrough in their history because they had a problem we did not have. We didn't have that problem of exclusivity where a king would say I'll only allow citizens to have this particular faith or something like that. So the idea of tolerance to solve a problem was not needed. 
So I proposed that we, I proposed in these different resolutions, all these years I've been saying, I scratch out tolerance and I say mutual respect. Now mutual respect means I respect you. It's not that there's something wrong with you, I respect you. That doesn't mean that my tradition is better or yours is better. I respect you for having your tradition. I want, it's mutual is very critical because sometimes people say, would you respect Bin Laden or Hitler? And I always say that mutual respect. It means Bin Laden would be disqualified because he does not respect others. So if he were to respect others, he would no longer be Bin Laden, if he were to respect others. So my offer of mutual respect is not unilateral, unconditional respect. It is if he gives reciprocity, then only way, just to make an impression politically. But philosophically and theologically, they have a very difficult time accepting mutual respect, accepting legitimacy of other paths when their own claim of exclusivity is a core requirement. It's a necessary condition for, their, uh, for the validity of their tradition. Now, this went to the, there was a UN summit in the year 2000, to, uh, a world uh, religious summit under the UN and uh, they were passing, they were drafting some resolutions. So I mentioned this, I had a brief discussion of this with the Hindu uh, leader leading the Hindu delegation and he said yes we will put in mutual respect. So the Vatican would not accept it and uh, he insisted we want mutual respect and the Vatican said we want tolerance. So this business of tolerance versus mutual respect became a very big political scandal and New York Times came out with a front page article that the summit might fail because of some language difficulty. They did not elaborate what it was. At the last minute, uh, Vatican conceded. The person leading the delegation was Cardinal Ratzinger, who later became Pope Benedict. That was how high level it was. He conceded and the resolution said mutual respect and everybody signed it. But within a month after that, after the delegation had all gone back to their homes, Vatican issues a clarification saying that while it's okay to respect others, the other faiths are a means, a preparation for the ultimate salvation that only we can give. So it's like I, you're in the kindergarten, maybe you're in the 10th grade, but I'm in the PhD level. So we, I respect you for, you know, preparing, but ultimately you have to come to our level. So that is a very uh, prob problematic area for these people. And this little shift in terminology, if you start implementing, wherever they say tolerance, you say mutual respect, you will find that uh, barriers will come up. And uh, once they understand what you are trying to say, what the difference really is. So I am glad you raised that. The second uh, point you made is very interesting that um, there may be a poetic understanding of something. It, it's not the same as rigorous scientific discovery. But I feel that while in Ghalib's case it may be like that, but I feel that uh, Vivekananda is referring to this Ankhya system and it's a very detailed taxonomy of the nature of the cosmos, the nature of reality, layers of you know uh, reality that exist. And he was referring to that as the energy matter equivalence that there is, they are ultimately one entity that uh, manifests in two different ways. Not quantified, certainly, uh, but a qualitative philosophical understanding. Sometimes a philosophical opening is a breakthrough because then scientists are at least open to thinking like that. Because if they are not even thinking like that, then you know, then, then there is a mental block, uh, one is in a certain box. And I would say in any case, when they write the history of ideas, when the West writes history of ideas, history of science, even these very undeveloped, non-quantitative, they like to take it back to, you know, Plato said this and so and so. They like to take it back to their own earlier origins to show the continuity of Western thought. And as part of Western universalism, you have to show that it is untainted, uncontaminated by anybody else and everything is self-sufficient and we are sort of uh, the perfect system. Whereas to bring in that certain things we got from here, certain ideas we got from there would be a legitimate thing and it would pierce the Western universalism and it would bring us more towards a human universalism, a human universalism where many people have played a role. You see, Western civilization has digested many civilizations. 
it digested the pre-Christian pagans of Europe and brought in many things from them. You know, the Christmas tree was pagan, the Easter was a pagan holiday, Valentine's Day, all these kind of things. They Christianized these and the pagans disappeared. But their ideas were taken. Similarly, the Native Americans, when the Europeans arrived, so much civilization was taken from the Native Americans, but Native Americans only live in a museum. You can see them, you go to a museum and you can see what they were like. And similarly, African cultures, so many of them finished off. So when the history of ideas and when the, the living, uh, uh, what is live, kept alive uh, is exclusively a linear trajectory of Western thought, then others are no longer relevant. They are replaced. They are redundant. This is why when you go to University of Chicago, you take a, one of the required courses is on Western civilization. Not world civilization, Western civilization. You, when you st most universities, when they teach classics in the West, they're teaching Western classics. But there's Indian classics too. Now, of course, there's pressure and a little bit they'll do here and there. But this idea of a continuous history of one civilization which is dominant and which is sort of got an absolute claim of the being superior is problematic for me. Yeah? And so the reason I bring in these ideas where they have introduced, like even, even the yogi is being studied by neuroscientists. You have to credit the neuroscientists for making value added. After all, the yogi achieves a certain state. But the neuroscientist comes up with various correlates in the brain and does calculations and figures out things and so on. You cannot say that he has done nothing. So it could be a joint discovery. It could be that in the history of ideas you have to first credit the yogi who learned how to do this. And then you have to credit the western neuroscientist who learned how to turn it into something more useful today or predictable today or measurable today. Whereas the yogi it was more a qualitative thing and not quantitative. So. I would say that in the history of science and technology, you have to acknowledge and be very explicit and honor all the civilizations that have made input. A huge amount of Western enlightenment, Western science came out of other places like mathematics out of India. But very rarely you will find, uh, some historians will know Indian origins of a lot of mathematics, infinite series, infinitesimal, these kind of things, long before the Westerners and Bodhanya long before Pythagoras. We, we know these things. But what's taught to the common person, including what's taught in India, unfortunately, is a very Western-centric uh, idea. That's a problem. Your final uh, thing about, uh, is there an Indian universalism? I don't know if there is one universalism or if there is many ways of knowing the truth. And I certainly feel that we, the stage we are in is a monopoly claim of a single universalism. We need to break that monopoly and create multiple ways of knowing the truth. And what that will lead to, I can't predict. Will it lead to a kind of a combination which, is, which includes all of these you know, approaches or will one dominate over others? I don't know. But that's what science is about, it's openness. Uh, I don't think that brute force power of colonialism should be the arbiter of deciding that the universalism of this culture is the right one. So all I'm trying to do is decolonize the methodologies that we have uh, inherited. Yeah. So a yeah, re response to Dr. Puri's question, you referred that in India we have uh, not given due respect to the ancient uh, knowledge which we had, uh, rather uh, it has been a Western thought, which is uh, mostly, uh, say, we understand or we f feel that uh, it is, a, uh, uh, say, whether it is science or whether it is chemistry or whether it is physics, that is the only truth. Uh, can you just uh, suggest uh, what is the origin and when it really started from your experience, please? Well, I think it started a thousand years ago because we had great viharas. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just uh, sorry to interrupt you, whether it has anything when the colonialism started in India, whether when it has any origin to Lord Macaulay who is uh, really yeah, yeah. Yeah, given... Yeah, that is part of the answer. That is, I, have to, I have to answer that. Sure, I understand. I think it started long before Macaulay because India had centers of learning like Nalanda, like Takshila Shila. These were destroyed long before the British came. They were destroyed. Uh, Muhammad Khilji's armies burnt uh, Nalanda and a huge library considered the, the largest library in the world 
many times bigger than the library of Alexandria. And Nalanda was a university where the brightest, the cream of the cream from various parts of Asia used to come. Like today people go to MIT, Stanford, Harvard, they used to come to Nalanda to learn. And so the knowledge, uh, the production of knowledge in these universities and these R&D centers were destroyed. So uh, the history of Nalanda is now preserved only through foreign students, Chinese students who wrote and other students who wrote about their experience in Nalanda. That has been utilized to reconstruct the history of Nalanda. Multiple volumes have been written on that. So I would say that the destruction of Indian centers of learning, which happened long ago, long before the British period, was the beginning of this decline of uh, R&D, indiv indigenous R&D. And the word Bihar is actually Vihar. It's Vihar. And Vihar is institutional learning. So it was, there were 20, 30 big Bihars. Nalanda was just one of them. Huge number of uh, you know, universities there in that part of the world. So one of the most backward states and less educated states today was actually one of the centers of learning of the whole of Asia at, the, at one point in time. So this is probably what did it. Now, uh, the Mughals had, they continued the manufacturing economy uh, because they settled and became Indians. So this continued the manufacturing economy and they built great monuments and they, they invested in culture. But I think in the, in the science of inquiry, challenge the, you know, challenging the existing knowledge is part of the paradigm. And I'm not sure how tolerant they were of, of people basically challenging the nature of truth. I don't, I'm not sure how tolerant they were. And the British, of course, wanted to also milk the Indian manufacturing economy for an, and at some kind of a huge 90, up to 90% taxation rates they had. Uh, and then gradually de-industrialize India and migrate this textile and steel industry to Britain. So part of this was necessary to create, it was necessary to create a kind of a servant mentality, a, a, a dependent mentality and therefore education had to be changed. And this is where Macaulay comes in to, uh, you know, sort of remove the traditional knowledge of India, remove the pride in India and introduce a new kind of a knowledge system. Uh, school, so the traditional part shala, you know, very close relationship between student and dis uh, teacher replaced by something far away. A guy called uh, Dharampal, some of you might know, he was, he was a Gandhian who just died some within the last five years. He actually went to England uh, and camped out there in their old archives before there were photocopies and all that available and manually transcribed a whole lot of East India Company records to bring back uh, East India Company's own uh, studies on Indian education before and after their intervention. Very interesting. Uh, how educated people were, how practical the education was in terms of farming knowledge or raising cattle or whatever versus what it became after the uh, intervention of Europe. So that is what happened. Superconscious and subconscious state of mind and during that we get some thought process which when we come to normal state of mind, awakened state and we speak it out without realizing or no really materialistic proof of the things. That's how the, some of the theories of Vivekananda which matter, energy and matter of the thing came or maybe even to some extent Kekule also commented on the same way for Benjin structure or the Karam Moon. Is it, and you also mentioned of vibrations. As the technology has evolved over the period of time, we have been having the equipment and devices to detect the vibration of different kinds. In India, there is a thought, some people believe, in premonitions and getting the message from one person to the other person at a very powerful place. And these are the, really nobody knows how it happens, but in the dreams, otherwise the message do good. Some people do have a, I think, verification of that. But is it that the phenomena is such we have not been able to detect those vibrations or those waves which are emitted out during the, these states like the people dream something here and somewhere else it is found to be true and there have been some cases where the things which have been dreamt by individuals have been found to be happening true. So is it that there is a science really in this and this needs to be studied. We have no equipment to detect those vibrations or those waves which are emitted out or which are received or transmitted by the object and subject. That's the thing. Yeah. yeah, I think is there this is a very. Philosophy or the thought process yeah, this is a very exciting question, and thank you for this. This is a very good question. 
Uh, I think we don't have the technology to directly measure, directly measure some of these very uh, high states of consciousness. But what the neuroscientists are trying to do is measure the effect it has, which is more macro. Uh, so there are certain discoveries they've already made uh, where uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the effect of something like this can be measured while the actual phenomenon itself is just a theoretical uh, you know, extrapolation. But then one could also say nobody has seen an electron. All, we, all we've seen is a, is a mark on a film. We've seen a mark on a film and we infer an electron. We infer that there's an electron we haven't seen, but there's a mark on a film and we, it keeps changing according to the laws of what an electron is supposed to be like. So there are things, even in the, in the material sense, which are so small that we infer their existence from something else we can observe. So, yeah, so our evidence, even in the case of something of this sort, like very, very subtle things, more subtle than exist normal matter, uh, we may never be able to actually see that directly, but if we can build a prediction, if we can build a model based on that assumption and that model produces a certain outcome and we can measure that outcome, we'll have to be scientific enough and accept yeah. it. So I think this is an exciting area of research and I, I track this quite a lot and I feel that uh, in this area of validation of our tradition, actually the West is doing more. They are doing a lot of research in this area. Uh, I know one place near Bangalore where they are, I think it's called Vyasa or something, they are trying to do this also. Uh, real neuroscientific effects of uh, advanced states of consciousness. But uh, it will be my job to keep reminding the West that when you get this breakthrough, it's a joint discovery and you have to uh, co-publish it with the yogi who produced this effect and you have the instrument to measure it and it is not that he's some footnote in the end saying some guy did it, some subject, they're calling them subjects, like some animals, some rats in a laboratory, yeah, yeah rats in a laboratory. So I'm just trying to make sure that the record is straight on that because then our tradition stays alive, it is not uh, put in a museum, it has some value and we can discover more things. You're not questioning the that the absolute truth itself is also means, uh, somewhat relative or something like that. No, I am saying that too. Because if you keep, if you keep the, uh, if you keep another knowledge system alive, which has a whole separate methodology, we cannot predict that its truths and the truths of normal material empirical science, external science are necessarily going to be the same or whether they will be in different realms, where they will converge, whether they will converge quickly or whether they will remain, uh, uh, remain uh, open ended for another hundred years or thousand years, we don't know. So all we know is that premature destruction or atrophy of a knowledge system is not a good idea. Without, without predicting who will win, is there a winner, will there be multiple winners without taking a stand on that because I don't know. And I'd love to be open-ended on this and leave it, leave it uncertain because uncertainty in this area is creative. Every civilization has its own evolution. And when they come into contact, there's a possibility of an amalgamation. So are you suggesting any insulation uh, no. process or anything like that? No. See, I'm, I want cross-fertilization. Ah. But uh, I, there is a difference in this book. There is a difference between cross-fertilization, which is good, and digestion. The difference is when a tiger digests a deer, there is no more deer left. The deer is finished. What he did not need, he left it out, the skin and whatever, and what he took in and could not digest properly, he throws it out. So that is what, is what ends up with a dead civilization which has been digested. So I do not want Indian civilization to get digested into the Western universalism. That does not mean Indian civilization should remain isolated. In fact, I would claim that for thousands of years, Indian civilization has had a very in detailed interaction with China, with the Middle East, with Africa, with Europe, with various parts of the world, or very slow, a very slow internet. 
people going by boat or people going by the silk route, taking knowledge with them, some thinkers and philosophers coming back, some linguists going, some agriculture scientists coming back. So I think a collaboration among civilizations has existed always. It's only in recent times that one civilization was able to so strongly dominate and control everybody in the world that it was able to sort of almost squash them and finish them off. That is the problem that I don't want. Uh, if I am not uh, incorrect, uh, since 712 AD, systematically Indian civilization, let it be history, let it be culture, let it be religion, everything has been smashed into bits. If I am sure it is uh, since the Arab invasion of Sindh and uh, with the superimposition of uh, Macaulay and Dowdwan filtration theory or Woods Despatch of 1854, almost many generations have come up in this country as well as elsewhere who completely depend upon the belief that has been fed into our minds by Vincent Arthur Smith or maybe Arnold Toynbee. What is your message? How to protect it? Can we protect it when the whole generation of intelligentsia have developed in this country depending upon the belief what has been supplied or spoon fed by the Britons? Yes. So I am an example of the resistance. I am an example of resisting this Western universalism. And I as one man can do only so much. But I am standing up and saying I reject this Eurocentric Indological thesis and theory of our history and origin of ideas and the paradigms and the philosophy. I reject that. And I am proposing many alternatives. Each chapter, there are four major differences metaphysical, physical, uh, philosophical differences that I'm proposing where there's an Indian challenge to Western universalism. And chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, each of them is one big idea that could almost be like a separate book. So this is my uh, contribution to actually try and reverse this colonialism that you are pointing out very correctly. The Indian intel intelligentsia has been raised on this. Uh, the trend of uh, getting digested into the West is becoming fashionable. Uh, many of the youth are picking up the wrong side of the West. West has some brilliant things to offer. West has good work ethic. There are many good things. We should pick up good things. But we don't have to stop being who we are. And a lot of the imitation that is going on is not of the good things of the West, but maybe the bad things. Mm -hmm. So I am very concerned about that, which is why I took early retirement when I was 44 from my business and dedicated my life since then. It's been 17 years. I'm 61 now, so 17 years I've had no job, no business, no work. I mean, I've basically put my time, you know, seven days a week to study this, to research, write, talk about it, and hope that other people can find value in it, can encourage this, propagate these ideas. Because I feel that uh, with the renaissance of Indian economy, Indians for the first time in recent have gained confidence. Now the question is how do we channel this confidence? Can we not create the equivalent of you know Ford Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation and Carnegie Endowment and all these great think tanks and what not that the West created? Can we not have our very big shots put in money into new kind of research on our terms, new scientific research? This is what I am trying to uh, encourage and I think with more money which we are generating and more confidence, if we can also combine that with a cultural and civilizational respect, we will actually be a much better nation, more respected by everybody else. So that is my hope. So last question. This is in continuation with Dr. Kulsrashtra's question. Uh, salvation or liberation or realization is something coming out of yogic practices which cannot be expressed who has liberated, like a living liberated person, will it be possible for the West with the, their modern equipments to validate this or quantify this? See, I don't know and I, I don't know how far the correlation, what you have, what you have are two realms, two realms, there is the inner realm of consciousness and spirituality and there is the outer realm which is measurable of matter. 
Now what they are measuring is a correlate. What they are trying to measure is the yogi uh, afterwards tells them that this is what I felt, this is my experience and then the machine tells them this is what it looked like. So they are trying to come up with correlates of the inner and outer and how far this will go, how far the correlations can be detected, uh, we do not know. Uh, and can they be, can they just keep going until very high states and ultimate states or is it only going to happen till a certain level? Uh, certainly you can tell whether a person is sleeping or awake through machines, okay. So we know that some, at some level of consciousness, what, uh, how, what your state of consciousness is, you, they can even measure when somebody is very angry and very, you know, whatever you can look at it, you tell. Now how far can we go, how high a level of consciousness and clarity and uh, stillness and uh, uh, you know non-dual consciousness ca can produce a correlate, we do not really know. So I think as scientists we have to not uh, sort of prejudge the outcome because one of the things that makes us scientists is we are open to discovery. So the discovery should go on, however long it will take us till whatever step it will take us we should be doing it.